up. Let's sing out this morning. Sing alone in my sorrow. Sing alone in my sorrow. And dead in my sin. Lost without hope. Lost without hope. With no place to begin. But your love made a way.
before you have a seat, would you squinch, squish, scooch um, to the middle of your row? If there are any open seats between you, well, let's push to the middle. And then once we've got all of our rows filled, you may have a seat. Yeah, it's great. Well, good morning. Happy Easter to each of you. Thank you for being here with us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a gift that we get to be together and celebrate. See, we have a lot of young people in the room. I'm going to start with a question for the kids. So because of the resurrection, we know that Jesus is alive. And my question to you is, if Jesus is alive, how does he live his life out on the earth today? Any hands raised? Any hands raised? Yes, right there. Yes, he died on the cross. That's true. Absolutely true. Yep. Any other? Yeah. He lives within us and through us. Absolutely. Amen. Yes, well said. Um, so, yeah, we get to be part of Jesus' life on earth. Isn't that wild? Isn't that, what an honor. And so that's why we gather every Sunday, 845 and 1030, to be part of Jesus' life uh, extended to our community. Also, we scatter into restaurants, homes, coffee shops, apartments, offices, in small groups, in cells, to extend the life of Jesus into our community. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love for you to join us, and you can see different ways on the screen behind me. Well, as you've probably already noticed, today we are gathered all together from our very youngest, to our oldest. So I have a special welcome to all of our kids. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We love it. And so parents, we recognize there might be a little bit more noise and movement, and it just adds to the beauty of our celebration today. So welcome, welcome. If you come on a regular Sunday, you will see our kids and our students scattered in their age-appropriate Worship expressions of large group and small group, cell celebration. But for this Sunday, for this Easter Sunday, we're all together. So family, let's lift up this time together in prayer. Pray with me. Lord, oh Jesus, today we celebrate. We celebrate your life, your death, and your resurrection. And it is with mind-blowing thankfulness of what that means for us individually. Just like we were singing, we are free. Death was arrested and we have been given new life. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning, this Easter Sunday, we want to express to you our gratefulness and our joy. And so church, let's continue doing that even right now in singing. Hey, would you stand? It is good for us to gather together and remind ourselves of the truth. It's good to declare the gospel. So let's do that together. How great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into Yeah. 
standing in your honor. And we recognize right now you are seated on a throne. Seated because your work is finished. Seated because you are at rest and your rule continues. Father, we recognize in our own hearts and our own lives there's territory of our hearts that we've kept from your rule and your reign and we surrender now to you and ask Accomplish what you want in our lives. We acknowledge your reign is good. Your reign is right. Your reign is peace. Your reign is just. Your reign is gracious. And your reign is great. We as your people are grateful. And we say to you, amen. Amen. Oh, good morning and happy Easter. He is risen. Where did that expression come for, from, for, from Christians on Easter time? 
where we know exactly how to respond. Even if maybe church is not your regular ex expression of life, you know you've heard that somewhere. It actually goes back to Luke chapter 24 when the disciples on the Emmaus Road, the two disciples, saw Jesus, the risen Jesus, and they ran back to Jerusalem, hustled back to find the other disciples hiding in an upper room, and they simply said this. <laughs> we saw the Lord, and he has risen indeed. And that, every, that changed everything for them. And ever since then, Christians have greeted each other this way. It, that tradition is part of our celebration. And celebrations are actually an important part of life. We know that, right? We know that uh, we only celebrate what we truly value. And so every good company hopefully knows that. Every healthy family hopefully knows that. Every vibrant church knows that. Even God himself knows that. He knows that we will value what we celebrate. And so ever since he began calling a people to himself, he built celebration into their life. In fact, for the nation of Israel, he even put those celebrations as seven feasts that they had to participate in. The nation of Israel had two groups of feasts. Some were in the spring and some were in the fall. And Leviticus 23 tells us the heartbeat behind them. Leviticus 23, God says, these are my appointed festivals. This is the party I'm throwing, he says. So you are to proclaim them as sacred assemblies. And that phrase, sacred assemblies, the Hebrew word could also mean dress rehearsals. I have uh, grandchildren who participate in dance and musical theater. I have been to plenty of dress rehearsals. Dress rehearsals are all good, but they're not the real thing. A dress rehearsal's job is to prepare the participant for the real thing. And in the same way for the Jewish feasts, God used them not only to help the Jews celebrate what he had been doing in their past, but to help them get ready as a dress rehearsal for the real thing that was coming in their future. Right now you're saying, so what does this have to do with Easter? Oh, such a good question this morning. Three of those feasts land right on that first Easter weekend. It started with the Feast of Passover, which is always on the 14th of Nisan. 14th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar this year is April 22nd, so our local Bentonville Jewish synagogue will celebrate its sundown on April 22nd. The very next day is the 15th of Nisan. That's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the very first Sunday morning after Passover Sabbath is called the Feast of First Fruits. Now, these feasts were mandatory for all Jewish males to participate in, not in their hometown, but they had to travel to Jerusalem. Most of those men brought their families with them, and they were become an extended festival. That meant Jerusalem changed during that time of year. I mean, Jerusalem was a sizable city in 33 AD. It was about 30,000 people. That's a pretty big city for that time of the ancient world. But during these festivals, Jerusalem would swell in size to about 200,000. Now, if you need some comparison mentally, imagine tomorrow morning a festival starts in Bentonville and 500,000 people will be here for it. That'll change the life of this town, wouldn't it? Now, you would think fellowship traffic is nothing once you've done Rainbow Curve in that, okay? And not only that, if you can imagine 4th of July, the Super Bowl, and the World Series all rolled up on one weekend celebration, dropped in your hometown, you're now beginning to get a picture of what that kind of celebration mode would have been in Jerusalem in 33 AD. Everyone was celebrating. As a result, everyone was preparing for the Passover feast, but they were preparing in different ways. Easter weekend actually starts in Mark chapter 14, showing us how one group was preparing. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Ten verses later, we see a different group preparing for the celebration. On the first day of Festival of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, 
where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So clearly everybody's preparing for the Passover, just not in the same way. The Jewish leaders and Judas, they were preparing for it by betraying and scheming to kill Jesus. But Jesus' disciples, they were wanting to celebrate with Jesus what God had done through the last 1,500 years of their history as a Jewish people, not quite knowing what would happen in this dress rehearsal as they look forward to the next. Remember, what you truly value will show up in how you celebrate. And there is one more person preparing for this Passover celebration weekend in 33 AD. And it's God himself. You see, for 1,500 years before Jesus, God had told his people to celebrate these three feasts. All of them were dress rehearsals, preparing for the real thing. And now on this Passover, the real thing begins. Right in front of their eyes. The dress rehearsal becomes reality. You see, all the previous 1,500 years of Passover feast, they began on the Sunday before that good, that Friday Passover meal. When the high priest would go out to the fields in Bethlehem and he would select the most spotless lamb. And on that Sunday, he would carry that lamb into the city of Jerusalem while the people lined the streets cheering. On this Passover, Jesus, on that Sunday morning, a day we call Palm Sunday, was entering into the city. The lamb of God and the high priest one and the same, as the people lined the streets and cheered. For 1,500 previous Passovers, the priests would gather in the temple around that lamb and for four days make sure they examined it regularly to make sure there would be no blemish, no spot, or, or no deformity would appear in that lamb. On this Passover, for the next four days, Jesus came into the temple every day and taught while the priest peppered him with examining questions to see if indeed what he could say could, be, could trap him. The people, they, the gospel writers tell us, were amazed at his teaching. They had never heard anything with authority like that. Even Pontius Pilate, at the end of the examination of the trials, his only conclusion was, I find no fault with him. You know, all the previous Passovers for 1,500 years, that spotless lamb would be sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan exactly at 3 p.m. with the high priest saying, it is finished, as he accomplished the sacrifice. On this Passover feast, Jesus dies on a cross on Friday the 14th of Nisan at 3 p.m., crying out with his own words, it is finished. Even during the Passover feast itself, the actual meal that they gather around, for 1,500 years, they would eat only unleavened bread. Unleavened, part of it was because leaven was a symbol, or yeast in our common language, was a symbol of sin. And they would bake that bread, and because it had no yeast in it, it would, grow, it would be baked flat, and it would have little stripes across it. And because the heat would permeate through that flat bread, it would pierce it, and there would be holes in that bread. They would break that bread, pass it around to one another, and drink, it, uh, drink a red cup of red wine in it. But on this Passover, Jesus picks up the striped, pierced bread, and he breaks it, and he passes it and a cup around. And in Matthew 26, he says this. While they were eating that Passover meal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Don't you see what the Savior is saying? The dress rehearsals are over. The reality has come, 
and I am he, the Passover lamb, that every year was, was slain and the blood poured for showing the forgiveness of sin. He said, I am the Passover lamb, and I am where forgiveness is found. How about the Feast of First Fruits? Well, for 1,500 years, that Feast of First Fruits would be celebrated on the first Sunday morning after Passover Sabbath. The whole point of that feast was simply to show gratitude to God for new life that came out of the ground. On this Passover feast, things changed. You see, for all the previous first fruit festivals, the priests would go out into a barley field on the day of Passover itself, and they would examine the grain. And the grain that was most ripe, they would call the new harvest or the first fruits. And after they agreed and examined on it, they would say, that will be our offering. At about the exact same time, Caiaphas, the high priest, was examining Jesus before his trial. Not only that, the priest would then take a red cord and they would bind it around that sheaf of, of barley, designating that as the first fruit offering. At about the exact same time, the priests were binding Jesus and taking him before the Roman governor to have execution pronounced. And then on the first Sunday morning, after that Sabbath, those same priests would go out into the barley field at dawn, harvest that first fruit, and present that to God in gratitude for his new life that came from the earth. At the exact same time, the stone was rolled away, and Jesus Christ burst from a tomb the first fruits of resurrected life. Men and women, all these historical feasts and all the details in them and the way they compare exactly to Jesus' death and res resurrection, that's not just coincidence. That's God telling a story for 1,500 years. You only repeat a story that much if you want your people to get it. And the story is this. It's a love story of redemption for people fallen in sin who need rescue. There was a man named Saul who was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Say it this way, a religious leader of religious leaders. He loved dress rehearsals. He perfected them. He made sure they were accomplished to the detail. But it was not until he met the risen Christ himself that he saw the dress rehearsals for the reality they had always been, and his life was changed. And we know his letters in the New Testament by his name, the Apostle Paul. And there he writes what this first fruits means for us who believe in God's story. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Paul says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. You see, the, for centuries, this feast on this weekend, we're telling twofold story. Passover and first fruits were telling a story, first of all, of our need, but second of all, of God's solution. And you actually see that story embedded right in this passage. In verse 21 and 22, you see our need, don't you? You see the fact that the scriptures there say that death came through a man. For in Adam all die. In other words, because sin comes to and through and from every one of us, death is the result. All of us, the text says, are in Adam, which means all of us have the same fallen nature that the first man had after the, the first sin. And sin, sin separates us from the life of God. And men and women, when you have been separated from life, the common word for that is death which means that every one of us struggles with the same two fundamental problems. I know we think our problems are unique. They're not. They're just unique expressions of the same two problems, sin 
and death. And we cannot solve these on our own. We cannot live by a new moral code or be religious enough or good enough to deliver ourselves from our own tendency towards sin. And you certainly cannot deliver yourself from death itself. We need someone to conquer sin and death for us. And Jesus Christ is that someone. You see, our problem of sin and death in this verse 21 and 22 Notice that they're bookended by verse 20 and 23. And it's the same solution. That Jesus Christ is the first fruit of our new life promised from us. Now think about that phrase, first fruit. We don't use that very often, do we? But we actually see it and have talked about it at least for two weeks. Every time you've driven through your neighborhood or even on your way to church this morning, you kept commenting that all the trees and the bushes were budding. That's the reason your allergy meds have gone up this last few weeks. Those are first fruits. And their job is simply to show that a harvest of more is coming. Well, so it is with Jesus Christ, our first fruit. It promises that more new life is coming. New life for those who believe in him. In fact, it promises two things right in verse 23 that I see. The first thing it promises is that our own resurrection will happen after we die. So this is not your only story. In fact, you don't even have to go out today and live your best life now because your best life comes after we die for those who believe in Jesus Christ. There is a resurrection of a whole new kind of life, body, soul, and spirit, waiting for the person who trusts in Christ and his fruits become their promise of new life. But secondly, even while we wait for that new body, new life, new fullness to come, the text says we belong to him now. So we are with him now. Men and women, God's solution for sin is not a reversal. It's a resurrection. We cannot go backwards and unsin and undie. We must go forward and find somebody to bring new life to us, or we need to be re life or to say it more like the Christian story says that we need to be resurrected. And we know that's what we long for at the heart because the, the words that we use to talk about our, most, our deepest heart longing all begin with the same two letters, R-E, re. And so we long for things like renewal, recreation, we want relationships to be reconciled, reconciled, or resolved. We want our bodies to be restored. We want uh, um, our, our dignity to be recovered. Uh, we need to be reclaimed. If you've lost a loved one, we want reuniting. We know we need to be redeemed, revived, reborn. There are no good longing rewords that don't find themselves in the root of the resurgence of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is God's promise of new life, and with new life comes a new song and a new hope for anyone who identifies with Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul ends the chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, breaking out in a in praise that actually causes him to either write an early hymn or an early piece of poetry. But he starts by saying, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. And then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? We just sang that this morning. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory. Stop. Victory over what? Sin and death are two greatest enemies. Where does it come? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is our first fruit, a harvest of change is waiting for everyone who identifies himself that their story 
becomes marked by Jesus' story. And his death and resurrection, and resurrection becomes their story. We will have an outside change in our bodies, but even while we wait for that final change to happen, we will have incremental, continual change emotionally, spiritually, relationally, mentally. In other words, we will experience a new resurrected power to become a new kind of man or, or woman. And I know I say the same thing every Easter. I just believe it's ever true, so I'll say it again. There is nothing that you're walking through today. There is no pain or valley that you will walk through tomorrow that a resurrection will not cure. Nothing. And that's not making try to feign. Because I have friends in this congregation who have lost spouses. They lost parents this year. They lost siblings. They lost friends. They lost a child this year. The resurrection of Jesus Christ promises a reunion with your loved one. Happiest of Easter's to you. There are people in this body that I know that are deeply estranged from folks that are very close to them. Adult children they have not seen for years. Friendships that have been broken. The resurrection of Jesus promises that we will sit around a banquet table of Jesus and enjoy each other one more time. There will be reconciliation and resolution. Happy Easter to you. I have friends in this body whose lives are driven by their chemotherapy treatments, their doctor's appointments, or they live with chronic pain or illness. The resurrection of Jesus promises a whole new body that has been restored and renewed. Oh, happiest of Easter's to you. This makes all the difference in the world. And it's the story that God wanted us to know so much that for 1,500 years, he kept demonstrating it by dress rehearsal. The Feast of Passovers, finding its reality in Jesus' death, which cleanses us from all sin. The Feast of first fruits, finding its reality in Jesus conquering the grave. Death has been defeated. His work on a bloody cross and in an empty tomb, it brings real promises to real believers in Jesus Christ. It is not a pontification. It is not esoteric. See, what the Feast of Passover fulfilled tells me is that Christ has redeemed me. What the, Christ, the, the Feast of First Fruits tells me is that Christ is with me and Christ will bring me home. Is that not the best news you have heard this day? All because of the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, say it with me out loud. Christ has redeemed me. Christ is with me. Christ will bring me home. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ for us. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he was raised to new life so that you could be both forgiven and alive with Christ. And, and all it takes to enter his kind of resurrected life is faith. And I know some people say, that sounds too easy. Oh, if you could look at a bloody cross, you would not call it easy at all. It is a free gift to us because it was costly to him. We receive that gift through faith or by believing and receiving. In other words, there's two things we have to believe. To become a Christian, you have to believe two things. You have to believe what God has said about you is true. That you have a sin problem that has separated you from God and you need a Savior. And trying to be your own functional Savior is not working, nor will it ever. You need God to save you. But then we have to believe something about God himself. We have to believe what he says, that he has paid for that sin on his cross. And he has given us new life in his empty tomb. And the best way I know to express that kind of faith and belief is prayer. 
Prayer is talking to God. And you're telling him what you believe. And so I'm going to close by praying a very short and simple prayer. And I'm going to pray it line by line. And maybe you're in that place where for you, Christianity has been kind of a religious dress rehearsal. You have great respect for it, but you didn't really have deep appreciation for its life-changing power. Happy Easter to you. This is your opportunity to step into the life that Jesus has for you. I invite you to pray this prayer line by line. Whisper it aloud as I pray it. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for rising from the dead to give me life. I open my heart and I receive you now. Start in me the life change of Easter resurrection. Amen. And we get to celebrate the life change of Easter resurrection through Kinsley's witness. Turn towards the baptismal. Uh, family, friends. Oh, can you hear me? I'd like to welcome my family, friends, and community group up. Um, we are so thankful that you're here. Um, happy Easter. What a beautiful message. Um, we are just eternally grateful. You guys come on up. <laughs> come on. Join the, join the crowd. Um, uh, we are eternally grateful to celebrate Easter Sunday and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Today is also a very special day um, for our family, friends, and community group as we gather to celebrate the baptism of our beloved Kinsley Tegan Sullivan. We have quite the crowd, as you can see. Um, we have uh, my family, my husband's family, our friends. We have family that have traveled here from Texas, Oklahoma, Chicago, um, all over. And so we're just so thankful. Um, Kinsley is almost nine years old. Uh, she has a huge heart for the Lord. She loves reading his word and applying his teachings to her daily life. Kinsley actually made the decision to invite Jesus into her heart almost three years ago on May 17th, 2021. She has waited so long for this exact moment and she has prepared her heart and she specifically requested to be baptized by her daddy um, with backstage help from Miss Caroline. <laughs> we are so thankful for fellowship and each and every one of you that have poured into her and touched her life along this journey. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, for the past three years, it has been so beautiful to witness, witness Kinsley's relationship with the Lord flourish. We have shared countless conversations, prayers, readings, all of which have nurtured her faith and strengthened her relationship with the Lord. And now, as she stands before you, Kinsley is ready to take the next step in her spiritual journey by publicly proclaiming her faith through the act of baptism. Kinsley, today marks a huge milestone in your life, a moment where you openly declare your love for the Lord and your commitment to walk in his ways. We are so proud of you. As you embark on this new chapter, always remember to keep your eyes fixed on the Lord, seeking his guidance and placing him at the forefront of your life. May this Easter Sunday be a reminder to all of us um, the power of faith, the beauty of God's love, and the transformative journey that truly lies ahead. Please continue to support and uplift Kinsley as she walks in the light of the Lord, and thank you all for joining us in this very, very special day. Happy Easter. Okay. Kinsley Teagan, is it your testimony today that you have trusted Jesus Christ to pay for your sin and give you eternal life? I now baptize you, my sister, in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen, church. I can think of no better way to respond than by standing together and worshiping. And oh, praise the name.
The blazing sun shall pierce the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face resurrection we are made right before you we are free from sin and death thank you Jesus you meet us in our sorrow you comfort us in our grief you empathize with our weaknesses thank you Jesus you are our hope you sealed us with your spirit when you come again you will make all things new thank you Jesus I mean, with that spirit of gratitude, I want to sing out this chorus together. Let this be our prayer all together. So I'll throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's not much. Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah So come on my soul Don't you get shy on me Lift up your soul Cause you got a lie
praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, but nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. He loves that posture. That we can come before the Lord just saying thank you. Guys, we're going to end this gathering with a familiar song, an anthem, as we sing in unity as we leave this place. Because we have a king who is alive. And so we're going to sing about our hope. And it's in Christ alone. Would you guys join with me? Every voice. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought. And still, what heights, what heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. to sing this stuff with you. Yes. It's good. And if you decided to follow Jesus today, we're really excited for you. It's a good gift to walk with Jesus. 
And if you want to talk about that or you have questions about Jesus or you have a burden that's too heavy for you to carry alone, we want to walk with you in that too. Our prayer team's up here by the baptismal. You can come talk to them. There's the connection booth in the lobby or there's the people around you. But otherwise, family, it's good to worship with you and go in the resurrection of Jesus. Happy Easter.